Good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for coming, and thank you for the organizing to uh, invite us to speak, or me. Uh, so this is joint work with uh, Andrew Hertzberg from the Philadelphia Fed, and so the regular disclaimer uh, is there. So these are not necessarily the views of the Federal Reserve System or the Philadelphia Fed. So when we started this project, uh, this was actually together with Andres Lieberman, who, um, from N NYU, who now left uh, academia. And so Andrew and I actually tell ourselves this is, has nothing to do with us. But so when we started this project, we were really interested to think about uh, heterogeneity in, in the functioning of the brain and how that impacts economic decisions uh, or financial decisions. And uh, we quickly realized that there are actually um, major challenges in, in analyzing such problems because, first of all, um, people, uh, it's not a binary state. So if you uh, have a mental health problem, so it, doctors cannot, like, uh, similar to breaking your leg, make an x-ray and decide, like, you either are mentally ill or you're not. So instead, this is a continuous uh, variable or a continuous state where some people have to decide if you belong to the distribution that we consider healthy or you belong to the distribution that we consider sick. And then secondly, if you would be naive and write, uh, run a regression looking at everybody's mental uh, medical records and just split everybody into those with a diagnosis and those without a diagnosis and see how they make their decisions, you, can, you quickly realize that these, this data set is really um, suffering from selection because it's not random who either seeks help or gets treated. So today I'm going to present you uh, a project or a paper which tries to deal with these challenges. And so what we're going to look at is the effects of being diagnosed for somebody uh, young, so a young adult, 18 year old, and see um, what happens if you're diagnosed for a marginally uh, mental health problem. So not the average mental health problem, but the, the marginal mental health problem. And so, to further motivate our, our uh, study, so being diagnosed with a mental illness is very prevalent. So this became maybe more salient during COVID. So in the US, between 2015 and 18, 13% 13 of uh, people older than 18 reported taking either antidepressants or um, in the last month. And so, focusing more on the topic of, of this study, so looking at 18-year-olds, then we see that in Sweden, in 2015, 8% of the 18-year-old men were diagnosed with a mental illness and 9% of the 18-year-old women. And so, what are the long-run effects of being diag diagnosed with a marginal mental health uh, diagnosis uh, when you were young? That's the uh, topic. And so whenever you enter the room late and you think, did I accidentally come in the wrong seminar? We're actually going to look at health, but also labor market and financial decisions uh, as a consequence of this diagnosis. And so how are you going to measure the effect of a diagnosis? So as I said, this is it's kind of uh, challenging. So we are going to... Um, make uh, use of the setting of the military service, mandatory military service in uh, Sweden that randomly assigned conscripts to doctors uh, during their testing um, period. And then we're going to measure these long-term effects by, by looking at the medical records of individuals and um, tax records uh, 20 years, so we can follow their, them for... Uh, 18 to 20 years after they did the conscript. And so let's think about how a diagnosis impacts you. So what follows after a diagnosis? So you either get treatment, so, and, and this treatment can be beneficial, but it can also potentially harm you. And so you, you either take pharmaceutical or other treatments, and these might have unintended effects that are studied in the, in the literature. I listed uh, a lot, so you could have uh, sleeping problems, they could induce even more depression or uh, weight gain, um, or even uh, there's some evidence of uh, excess death. Um, but then, besides the medical treatment or the pharmaceutical medical treatment, this also impacts how you view yourself, so how, uh, how you think 
your mental health uh, has been uh, evaluated by yourself, but it also influences, and this might impact how often you would seek help later in life, but it also impacts how other people view you, so, and, and most notable other doctors who would look later on to your medical records, and this might impact how they will view the new, um, uh, the new questions that you will ask a doctor in the future. And then lastly, and this is the one that we think is the least interesting, because this would limit the external validity of our study, is of course that our, our effects are driven by the fact that you didn't do the military service. And so we're gonna try to rule out this channel and uh, by using an other uh, identification strategy that we borrow from Jarmerson and Lindquist. Okay, so let's think about the ideal, ideal experiment. So ideally you would have like a big, group of people that you would split and uh, so that the distribution of underlying mental health, which I plotted on the x-axis here, is uh, identical between the two groups. And then group A would meet a doctor that has a low tendency to diagnose you with a mental illness. And the group B would meet a doctor that is more likely to a higher tendency to diagnose you with a mental illness. Then if we follow these two groups over time, then we try to argue that the difference that we find is really generated by the difference in these two uh, groups to be diagnosed with a mental illness. And of course, the requirements for this ideal experiment is that this ex ante, these two groups are identical, so you really require that this assignment to the two groups is truly random, and so we do a bunch of tasks in, in the paper where we check if, based on observables, we see any difference between the groups who are assigned to doctors. And then, furthermore, of course, you need to have this variation in uh, the tendency to diagnose among the doctors that work at, at the conscription, and, uh, and it should be predictive so these different tendencies should also be predictive of the next uh, conscript that meets you in the office. And then lastly, and this is actually a tall order, uh, we need to assume that these doctors agree about the ranking of each conscript. So it, it should be true that each doctor agrees with each other that these uh, are the really sick people and these are the really healthy people. And so, but, and, and this is very important because you want the identification to come from the marginal patient. So you don't want um, suddenly that one doctor um, puts in a very sick person at the threshold of being diagnosed or not. And so we do, a, this is a, an assumption that you cannot directly test, but we do a bunch of uh, work to try to show, the, convince the reader that this, there is monotonicity. Okay, so between 1901 and 2010, there was mandatory min, uh, military conscription. So every male uh, that is going to the regional test office to do two days of testing of both your physical health and your mental health. Um, and to, do, to judge if you were fit to serve. And then as part of this pro, uh, process, you meet this general physician. And uh, this general physician needs to stick to this protocol where um, they, they test your physical health, but also a protocol to test your mental health. Um, yeah, and so, there's, so the assignment is as good as random. So the way it worked is that you uh, were done with all your physical tests and IQ tests, and you get, uh, came into the uh, room where the doctors were, and you put your file in the box, and then you were asked to sit down, and then as soon as the doctor was free, one of your, uh, the file was taken from the pile of, um, of all the results. And so, um, yeah, as I said, and so there are two uh, features that are really in, uh, good for us, the econometrician, and so the doctors were obliged to give you also a, a diagnosis, so, and they use this international code of uh, diagnostics so, uh, that is um, implemented around the world. But then secondly, they also have to give you a severity score, and so they have to judge, it's going from one to nine, and it is an indication how sick 
how mentally ill are you? So if you're depressed, they have to give you also a judgment of how depressed are you from one to nine. And this really helps us to, for example, nail down this monotonicity to check if, if the doctors do disagree more about um, mild cases or they disagree more about severe cases. And then um, another feature that is really good for us is that the doctors themselves do not also subscribe the treatment. And so if you're diagnosed during the conscription, you were informed and then um, referred to uh, doctors outside the military for treatment. Yeah, and then, di so this is good to note, as, so being diagnosed with a mental illness in general lowers the probability to serve in the military by 38%. And so the sample that we end up with um, is those uh, boys or men that uh, enlist between 1989 and 2001. And they, the way we selected doctors, because the overall level to diagnose during this period was 3%. And so we need to have each doctor have a, a quite a lot of conscriptions uh, to meet a lot of conscriptions. So we select doctors that see at least 500 conscriptions per year in these regional centers. And there mu must be at least two to three doctors in each regional centers. Um, and so this results into a sample of 400,000 conscriptions that are seen by 102 doctors. And so again, we link these uh, data with uh, their medical records and uh, tax records on wealth, family, and labor market outcomes. And so this, is what we're doing, and so this is really standard, so just to tell you in words, because I have no time to go over the formulas. So what we do, this is a standard uh, leniency calculation that is used in the literature. What, what we do is we try to calculate for each conscription uh, the tendency of the doctor, so how many of the patients or conscripts that the doctor saw uh, before you, what share were diagnosed with a mental illness, and not taking you into account, and then uh, taking care, so, and we compare that share with this, the colleagues of these doctors during that year at that center, and we try to control, are we controlling for time trends in, in diagno diagnosis, and also center uh, fixed effects. Okay, and so this is the graph where you, we plot the tendencies of the doctors, and what you can see is that there is variation in this tendency to, to diagnose. And furthermore, what is important, these tendencies are actually predictive of you being diagnosed yourself. And so that is the, the uh, 45 degree line. And so let's go to the main results. So, so here, and I notice, <coughs> sorry, on the x-axis it's now zeros, but it's supposed to be the percentage of um, uh, this, the percentage of standard deviations by the non-diagnosed. And you can see on the right um, column where we see the numbers, 33.4, for example, that's supposed to be on the x-axis. I'm sorry, I apologize for this. And so what we find in terms of health, we find that there is a significant increase. And so the dark dots uh, are, means that it is at a 1% significance level and the, the vertical line is zero. Um, so we find an increase in the likelihood to die from internal death, and we evaluate this first at the age of 30, and the reason why we chose 30 is that there is some literature of labor from the labor market that uh, suggests that at the age 30, 35, your outcomes are most predictive of your uh, life outcomes in terms of, for example, permanent income. Um, but later on, I will show, I hopefully I have time to show you some results for other ages. And so you see this increase uh, in the likelihood to die. And then we also find an increase uh, to, to be admitted at the hospital as an outpatient. So this includes the ER or other um, treatments that don't require you to stay over at the hospital. And uh, we find an increase of 9.4 days uh, in sick days from work. And then if you wonder what internal debt means, so this is something defined by the, the medical uh, profession. And so you have external debt, for example, that would include all the uh, ways to die from external causes like an 
car accident, su um, suicide actually. Um, and internal that, here I give you the top five for the sample that we study who died from any, uh, these causes. Uh, and so um, you, you can see that there is some theme that has to do with dying from um, um, causes that had to do with medication. So if you look at opioids um, and due to multiple drug use and uh, epilepsy and then myocarditis is an infection of the heart uh, muscle. And, and just as an economist, I, in the beginning, I was quite surprised that mental illness is related to physical illness, but whenever I present this at um, academic hospitals or something, they have zero surprise that mental illness is related to actually your physical health. Um, so now, more relevant for this conference, of course, let's look at some labor market outcomes. So we find significant increase in being either long-term uh, unemployed, so this is one year without an um, uh, uh, employment, or a short spell of unemployment, which is uh, less than one year um, uh, unemployed. And then furthermore, we find, if you look at, um, and so the fact that we don't find an effect of these un unemployment on income is probably to do with the social welfare system in Sweden. And, um, but we do see that there is a decrease, but not significant. And then looking at household formation, we find evidence that the age of 30 to be less likely to be married and at other ages to less likely to have children. And then, um, most important for this conference, I guess, is really the household finance. And so if you look at the first set of results in the, in the upper panel, then these are actually taken from the Weld Registry. So we have, so for these outcome variable, variables, we're really a little bit struggling that we have less long panels, so we can't really um, take, for example, uh, the age of 30, because then there would be a, a much less balanced panel uh, than if we look at uh, younger ages. So here we're gonna look at wealth at 28, your bank account at 28, stock market participation, etc. And what we find is actually uh, almost nothing is significantly different from zero at a reasonable uh, significance level, except having liquidity at your bank account, which we find evidence that this has, is diminished for people with a marginal mental health diagnosis uh, that was be given to you at 18. And then there is some evidence here that you are more likely to have a negative flag on your credit records. Um, so you have an error. Okay. So thus, so to summarize, we think these diagnoses at the age of 18 uh, makes the patient more, uh, worse off compared to your marginal uh, conscript that didn't, were not diagnosed. And this, we find a similar pattern when we look at other ages. So in the paper, I have <coughs> all, we have all these graphs where, you, where we plot, we estimate these equations to state root squares for each age and then we uh, plot uh, what's happening at other ages. But the same pattern uh, exists. Yeah, and so the the key question is, of course, how does this work? What's the mechanism behind it? And first, we want to rule out uh, that this is driven by not serving in the military. And so, for, as I said, we're going to lean on this identification strategy that is already uh, been implemented and published um, in uh, econ journals. And so, there is another random assignment of these conscriptions to an officiator who's going to uh, decide if you're going to serve or not. And so what we do, we hold, um, yes, we, we hold the outcome variable stable, we implement these, um, this new identification strategy, and then in red I'm plotting the, the outcomes for um, the outcomes of doing the military service, so serving in the military for the same outcome variables. And in gray, I plot our results. And the point we want to make is that even if these people would have served, and these were the slightly positive results, then they would, could never uh, undermine the negative results that we find. Um, 
yeah, and so you see that these results from serving in the military are typically small, but in a more positive. Uh, so instead of the likelihood to be unemployed, the, this likelihood uh, when you serve diminishes, for example. And then the last results that I uh, wanted to show you is, and so if this would go through the medication that you take, then uh, what we wanted to, sh to have evidence of is so we find um, some evidence that people at age 30 are more likely to take antidepressants, uh, but this is uh, only barely significant. But so the data set where we, look, where we can see you, the medication that you take is actually starts later uh, than uh, conscription, and we observe your conscription. So we can see what medication you take later in life, but we can't uh, see for our main uh, sample what medication did you do as a consequence of your diagnosis during conscription. So for this um, suggestive evidence, we look at uh, the conscription that is done in 2005 and 6, which already at that period, the mand mandatory requirement to do this conscription was m diminished. So you see that there are the percentage of the cohorts that have to go to conscription is lower, but it's nevertheless randomly assigned to, um, to the doctors in conscription, but it's more less representative for the whole cohort. So you have a selection uh, problem here. But that said, all, all these um, um, uh, caveats, then here we plot for this sample what happens to your medication uh, intake at the time of your conscription, which is zero at, at, uh, at the vertical line. And then we plot those that were met by a, a, a above the medium, tendency to be diagnosed doctor versus uh, below the medium. So above the medium, so you have a higher tendency to be diagnosed, is in the red dots, and you can see that they have indeed uh, a higher probability to take medications right after a conscription. So on the, on the x-axis, these are uh, weeks uh, after conscription. Okay, and so to conclude, so we, present you evidence of the long-term effects of a met <laughs> mental illness diagnosis. <laughs> um, and so we find that there, there are harmful effects to be diagnosed for the, marginal, uh, with the mar for the marginal patients, so those with a marginal mental health problem. Um, and these, these, uh, we find that at the age 30, but we find a similar pattern uh, over the rest of, of the 20 years after diagnosis. Uh, And so when, so how would you, uh, what are the takeaways policy-wise? So when, what we think is that when you're considering diagnosing, and I think now during COVID, this might actually be very relevant. So when you're considering diagnosing young adults with a marginal mental health problem, then um, it might be good to think about the potential benefits and cost of these. Um, and Furthermore, if you think about treatment, then this might be one uh, avenue to go to evaluate what type of treatment should we give to young adults uh, when they're diagnosed with a marginal mental health problem. Um, yeah, and so maybe I, I took that slide out because I thought I would have time problems, but so the typical mental health diagnoses that are given during a conscription that are uh, not severe, so the, those that are uh, that the doctors don't agree about um, is really anxiety, depression, and um, a, a diagnosis of, a, of an unexplained physical illness. Uh, so that is assigned to your mental health. Okay, and then of course, what is a, a big limitation of our study is that we can only study men, so it would be super interesting to know what happens to the women, because they are, the percentage of women that are diagnosed, young women that are diagnosed with mental illness is higher than men. Uh, and of course, what happens for people uh, that are diagnosed later on in life. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>